everybody. How you living? We're back. No putts given. We're on location. We are at TPI, Oceanside, California, and we brought guests. Obviously, we have Tony, but why don't you guys introduce yourselves? We we got <laughs> found a couple random guys here at Titleist that we thought might be able to help inform our conversation. So, gentlemen. I'm Kevin Tosistro, Director of Wedge Development. And I'm Aaron Dill, Director of Wedge Relations. Are those tour real? stuff. I do tour stuff. Are those <laughs> real terms? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Somebody else made this up. Introduces the wedges <laughs> to each other. Make sure Hi. everybody's getting along. Yeah. So obviously, we're, we're going to talk SM10. We can say that term because by the time this video comes out, everything will be fine. We're all good. So let's just dive in first. We are Tony United Fittings. We'll kind of talk about some of that stuff in a minute too, but why not SMX? Let's start there. No, we don't have to start there. <laughs> but what is, I guess, first thing out of the gate, what should consumers know about SM10? If they know nothing else, what are a couple of major changes? Well, uh, I think it's important to know that everything that we do when we design, we look at everything. We look at the shapes. We look at the score lines. We look at the grinds. Are those right? Do we have enough pieces in the matrix? Are our finishes where we want them to be? Um, my job as a tour rep is to bring that valuable information home that I'm learning from our players around the globe and share it with Kevin. And Kevin is the brains behind the operation who says, well, these are the little things that we have to do in order to make those changes. Um, for me, it's really about fine tuning the things that our players are asking for. They're, they're talking about shapes. They're talking about leading edges. We're talking about trajectory and spin management and all the little things that helps those guys focus on what they're going to do, which is play the best golf that they can. But I know nothing about the engineering side, so I allow Kevin to help me figure out those things. But again, it's, it's, it's about focusing on everything possible that the line is going to be basically based on. So what, what were the dominant trends? Like you said, you just mentioned a couple of them. Like, because tour players are probably in your ear all the time, right? Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? How about more of this, less of that? And then I have to imagine you developed themes. If 100 guys are telling you the same thing, that maybe says something. What, what stood out from SM9 to SM10 in terms of things that you were hearing clearly from, the, you know, like you said, best players in the world, the Justin Thomases, the Jordan Spieths, et cetera? That's a good question. I think there's a consensus amongst the best players. Whether you're the best player in the world or just a beginning golfer, I think that there are things that golfers value, right? And when it comes to wedge play, trajectory is something that players are really asking for. How do you help me find a lower launch window? What's it going to take, right? I tend to throw the club at impact. I hit it higher than I want to. Why is my ball not spinning? And so these are the little things that, that I hear from players. How do we make that ball flight stay through the lower windows more often? How do I increase spin around the greens? That's another thing that our players love. And players are constantly challenging us to come up with grinds and shapes and just general leading edge, top line, toe profiles that are more attractive than they've ever been. How long, how long before, so SM10 is gonna be on tour and people, I would imagine your tour guys are gonna be like, oh, this is great, I love it. But how long before you get into the, but it would be nice if, like, how long before we, we have to start thinking about SM11 changes based on tour feedback? It happens pretty fast. There's a honeymoon period. <laughs> There's a honeymoon period, you know, when you, when you first give it to them, everybody's excited. I know we're excited. Um, once we get it out into the open and, and players are allowed to get to know it a little bit and they're, they're playing golf and they're finding some success with it, we're testing, we're exploring different things. You know, that's where I start asking those tough questions. They may not be forthcoming and saying, hey, I wish that this did this, or I want this. That's where I start asking, well, how can we do better? You know, what are we missing here that maybe you want us to focus on? And that's where I meet up with Kevin to have those discussions to say, hey, everything's going really great, but I think these are some avenues we should explore for what's coming down the line. Yeah. So Kevin, question for you two with like, like I said, fortunately, you're the brains behind the operation, right? That's a, theoretically, that's a good thing. Um, what do consumers not get about wedge design that you wish they would in terms of, like we, we talked about these iterative changes, right? Like, hey, right, one of the most common things on tours, hey, I want to keep everything the same but make it better. You're like, yeah, no problem. We can absolutely do that or not. But you have to do that then right? Make it, keep the things that are really good about a previous generation, but 
assuming that that previous generation was your best work at that time, right. now you have to also make it better. So what should consumers know about how difficult that is or where are the biggest challenges? Yeah, I mean, we focus on three things, right? Shop versatility through grinds, uh, distance and trajectory control through CG, and then spin through score lines. And we try to improve on all three of those, but I think the most important is the grinds part. Um, whether or not the consumer understands grinds is, again, it's nice to know what you're kind of working with, but if they just know that I need to find one which works for me, I think when we all get fit for wedges, you find out, oh, there is a difference. And it means so much to the total performance of the club. One grind may not work and produces a high, no spinning shot, and the next one produces a low spinning shot. We're going after that low spinning shot. Why does it work? Sometimes you don't have to know why, but just know that there is an option for that consumer or tour player that will work. Yeah. And what, I mean, because we've talked to you like things that toggle, right? Like you do more of this, but that generally means less of something else, right? Like there's a, there's an opportunity cost, yeah. I guess, to different elements at how you design them. What are the biggest opportunity costs in a wedge? And why does that make it challenging to iterate something that does everything, but yet does it all better. Right, so uh, we just talked about the grind. Um, the grinds come from years of research and Bob Vokey and Aaron creating these grinds that work for specific players or even all the way down to a general consumer. But once that soul is locked in, we now have to kind of build around the soul. So if you look at your, your T and your L grinds, these thin soles, that means we didn't use a lot of the weight that we need. So where are we gonna put this weight? Okay, some are easier. We can put it in the top line. We can put it in the hosel. Then you get to your larger soles, your Ds and your Ks. Big, massive soles, you know, more forgiving. All right, now we used a lot of weight. We don't have enough now to make the whole club. And there's just, there's certain things that Aaron kind of helps us with in designing and saying, hey, we can, we can give up weight over here, but not over here. So um, again, the hosels, the top line thicknesses, but we have room in the back, our back flange angles, we call them, uh, that kind of help change the weight to make sure we get the CG in the right spot. Hmm. So with, so let's just go from SM9, because that's the one that most consumers are most familiar with, right? Even though we know a lot of consumers haven't upgraded since maybe two or three generations before that, but compared to SM9, what are the biggest differences in SM10 other than the fact that you don't have Tony's favorite uh, finish. That. So to start off, we have uh, a new finish. Uh, it's called Nickel. Yeah, it is. After you. Yeah, yeah it is. That's the reason yeah, why we did it. Not fair. <laughs> so not fair. Sometimes. <laughs> um, that'll replace brush steel. Um, it's a little bit more durable. Uh, helps with bag chatter a lot. Um, it's kind of a tweener between chrome and jet black. Definitely more durable. I totally <laughs> agree. <laughs> um, the next part is the, the grind matrix. We're going from 23 to 25 grinds. We've added the 5408M back in the lineup. Okay. And now, we're, now we have the 58 and 6004T grind. So the T has replaced the L gotcha. for low bounce and those lofts. <clears throat> um, in terms of you know, our trajectory control, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the 46 through 52, we've taken the CG and pushed it a little bit closer to center face. Okay. It's still heel biased, but that's going to allow less of a draw bias. So it's going to slow down the club head during the swing, help it go a little right for right-handers. Okay, so when we're talking about this, or kind of talking this middle part, right? So the CG location has always been toward the heel, right? On, so it's kind of a heel side CG. So what you're saying is it's still heel side. It's still heel it's still this way, but it's closer to the center than it was before. Correct. And by okay. bringing it closer to the center, it's going to slow down the closure rate. Just to eliminate some of the draw bias. So we hear, though, with a lot of competitors, new wedges, like CG is perfectly centered. And it kind of becomes a talking point, a selling point. So, and, and you're saying, hey, we're, we're still heel biased. We want to be heel biased. So what, what is the advantage of being heel biased? Why would you want to be not perfectly center? Sure. So... Wedges in the past have been very heel biased. Um, 
what does that do? That increases closure rate from 46 through 62. Well, not all wedges are made for the same purpose. Um, the shorter, they're the stronger lofts, 46 through 52, are probably meant for more of distance gapping with your irons. So where are those CGs? Those CGs are kind of more towards center, but not centered. But then as we get towards the 54 through 60s, we progressively go more towards the heel because we want to incre increase closure rate because that club is used for shots full all the way down to 10 feet from the green. So if I'm swinging it lightly, I need to swing that club. And if I'm swinging it fully, I want to be able, what I put into it is what I want to get out of it. Now, if that CG gets too far towards the center or at center, that club is going to start to work against me a little bit. If I just take the club and throw a ball at it with a center CG, I'm going to get a very fast rebound. If I move the CG over, I'll get a little bit slower rebound. But with the CG to the heel, I get a faster closure rate, which increases speed, but I lose some of that by hitting it off center. So it's kind of a, a give and take, but I've gained the ability to hit multiple shots without losing ball speed effects. By having the CG towards center, I'm starting to lose the ability to hit every shot because the club is going to want to droop more, slow down, and I'm, I'm going to start hitting worse shots from all over. So it sounds like part of the versatility, right? Yeah. And we, we hear that in wedges a lot. It's versatile grinds. What, what does versatility mean to, to the Vokey team as, as it relates to wedge performance? It's right in here, Alex. <laughs> yeah. Well, for, for us on tour, versatility basically means I want to be able to hit as many shots around the greens as I can. I think, simply put, give me less bounce so I can pull off those crazy wild shots that we see the best in the world do. Versatility is extremely important. It's why the T-Grind is the number one wedge we use on tour. Um, but we can't stop there, right? That's why we have so many different versions of our 58s and 60s is to have versatility in different ways. Your D grinds are very bounce driven in the front. So if you're a steeper player who is a little, you know, is a little down, you're going to love that bounce in the front, but you do have the polishing in the back to allow you to open up the face when you need to. The M is Bob's most favorite wedge. That one is again, a very similar best of both worlds sort of wedge where it's not as much in the front, but it's also less in the back. So if you need it from the fairway, you can have it, but if you need to be around the greens, you have a little width and you have a little polishing on the back to, to allow for those things. And then the T is just that extreme version of conditions are firm, I need to hit flop shots. You know, those types of things where, where, where you can pull off those different shots. For, for the best in the world, versatility is, is essentially give me a wedge that does all the wild stuff I need it to do when I'm greenside. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's interesting. Let's go into, so biggest differences again, from nine to 10, we have obviously some of that, but one of the things that jumped out, I think Tony, you would say this too, is the shaping of it. And, and meaning like you would get wedges, you would put them down, you can almost tell what wedge it was just by how it was sitting in front of you. You guys made a concerted effort to have every wedge within a certain loft, regardless of what the grind is, look exactly the same. Number one, why? Why do that? So I, I think a big point is the first thing that a golfer usually does when he grabs a club is he puts it down. Does it look good? And sometimes he puts down a club to try and that just doesn't look good. Well, don't worry about the shape, hit the grind. That's what we're trying to test. Um, in the past, we've tried to make them look the same, um, but as now we've gotten better at using the computers, we've really locked in, call it the profile and the, and the hosels and the blade lengths uh, before putting the sole on, basically. I mean, Aaron's come to us and said, this, the, the T grind looks great and everyone's playing it, but he goes, you know, the M grind just looks a little different and I'm having troubles getting guys into it. We're having to do a lot of custom polishing. Well, to help him out and to help everyone is we locked in that profile and the hosels, and then again, like I said, put the sole on afterwards so that when you put, doesn't matter which 60 you put down or club within a loft set, is that's gonna look the same. And the only difference is the sole. So maybe leading, height, leading edge height changes based on the sole, but when I put it down, that shape, that Vokey shape that we're all accustomed to looks fantastic, and then it's just, I'm testing for grind. So kind of touching on the grind stuff, usually we talk about, you know, in the past, 
heavily when we talk about grind, it's, it's again, the versatility piece, but, but how it moves through the turf, right? What, what I found really interesting when I did my fitting was, was seeing how much the trajectory changed just by changing the grind, which kind of blew my mind. I'm like, hey, these are, these are both 54s, but this one is, is flying a lot lower. This is, this is hitting the window I want to see. What, what causes that? <laughs> <laughs> and why, why would it, why for example, why, why would a wedge that flies lower for me or hits the right window for me not be the right wedge to hit that same window for somebody else? Well, fitting is very important. It's something we talk about every day. We encourage anybody who's going to play golf, invest in golf, go out and experience what these different wedges do. I mean, how do you really know what's best for you if you don't go out and figure it out? Um, grooves two through five is the sweet spot you want to live in. I'm and more we of tell, an 8 through 12 kind of guy. 8 through 12 is a bad place to live. But when we, zero through one. When, we talk about, when we talk about strike locations, groups 2 through 5 is essentially this spot here. And, and this is where we want our golf ball to live at all times. The importance of fitting and finding the right grinds is helping us find that location more often, right? Anything above that, launch angle is going to go up, spin is going to reduce, and the carry is going to shrink. And there's nothing more frustrating than being in kind of a go zone scenario where you can hit the shot, have it float a little bit and have it land four or five yards short and you're having to chip again. So when, we've, when we work with players, even with you guys, like we went through this process of having you test and try different things, allowing you to experience not only how to feel through the turf, but where the ball is making contact and how important it is to make contact in the right spot. That's why it's so important to get fit, number one, but also to offer these different grinds because conditions are changing. You know, if you play in Scottsdale and it's firm and dry, or you go to the Midwest, you're going to have different moistures. You're going to have different soil types, different grass types. And so it's important to make sure that the right grind fits your style of playing where you're playing. So like, yeah, like we're saying, we both got fit, Tony. So like, what were your biggest takeaways? Like, because we've both been through a lot of wedge fittings. There's a couple of things that really surprised me on mine, but like we did them independently, didn't watch each other. Full disclosure, had no idea what was going on. And, and yet, and yet, yet, and yet, we ended up with nearly identical specs. There you go. And by nearly identical, I mean the same, right? Pretty much. So, what I guess, what were the biggest takeaways for you from that? I mean, experience? a couple of things. Like, like yeah. I mentioned before, the seeing trajectory change, and, and I would say even dramatically, from just changing a grind, and and this time with with those shapes being consistent, not being able to go like I, I mentioned earlier, right? With the uh, the first time Corey sent me a low bounce K, I look at him like I, it just looks different than what I'm playing. So it's just like mentally I couldn't handle it. Now to, to be able to get, kind of move between grinds and have nothing really visible, maybe something on that leading edge if you look really close as it's sitting on the ground, but nothing radically different and seeing the trajectory change, that was eye opening for sure. And then kind of the, the little stuff around the green where we, we intentionally started out with, for me, what is a tricky shot with a little bit of a bunker carry. And I'm like, you know, trying to hit the tee grind and be precise, hit it high, yeah. land it soft, and then realizing, like, it doesn't look like a lot of green, but if I just square face an F grind sand wedge and hit the easiest <laughs> shot, just a little painless, you know, I'm just going to knock it up there and seeing that, like, oh, look at that. That shot with that low trajectory is going to stop even arguably better than the high soft one like that was that was kind of like all right wait a minute this this can fundamentally change how i approach the shot and yeah. and the other thing i would say like not having to manipulate it where i didn't have to feel like all right i want to i want to flight this low i want to kind of just punch it up there and not feeling like all right i got to de-loft it and do all this stuff i'm like just just a Simple really line. easy yeah like as easy as this game could possibly be right on that shot we overcomplicate golf we really do i mean we hit a ton of shots together and one of the things that I noticed was the sand wedge was was rarely used for what it's intended for, right? It's like, it's like we, we had what shots, a concept. Yeah, we right? had shots like, together. I think I even joked and said that's why they call it a sand wedge. wedge you know, right? get it in the get in the sand. You know, the less lofted wedges tend to outperform the higher lofted wedges. I mean, there's there's a value in a 60, and, and it's like great. It hits higher. It probably spins a little more. It maybe you know lands a little softer. In actuality, the consistency that comes from a sand wedge is pretty remarkable. And when you expose players through the fitting process of understanding, like, hey, you've got the sandwich. I understand it's a fairway club, and you hit it 110 yards, whatever. Um, let's take a greenside, see if there's value in that. 
and they, they hit a couple shots, and they go, oh my, this is easier than my lob wedge. Um, way yeah, this is way easier and yeah. more consistent. It's through the same windows, it spins a bunch, and it's consistently landing in the same spot 20, 30 yards away. It, there's no reason why I shouldn't hit this more. Yeah, I think, I mean, two thoughts on that. One, my bias was I'm not going to be able to hit this high enough around the green, meaning, you know, want to default to a 60 or something and say, hey, because I know I can hit that high enough to do what I need as soon, to do. As soon as there's a bunker, like whatever, it's got to go yeah. way over the bunker. It can't right. be enough to just be like plenty. It's got to be right. way. Well, and then you said something, or maybe you did too. The idea that, you know, bunkers are in the ground. So it's not like, yes, there are pot bunkers and things where you have to hit it straight up in the air, to get, you know, whatever. But the vast majority of bunkers on most courses are dug out and down. So it's not like you have to hit it crazy high. It's not like a tree. No that you're trying to get over. So there's a pretty good chance you're even 50 or 54, 56 sure. is gonna give you. 50 mm, sounds crazy, I'm uh, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's gonna give you enough lot. I mean, and so I, that was something for me around the greens, you know, that it's like, you will be able to hit this high enough with enough spin to get it to stop. Um, and I, I wasn't necessarily convinced of that, you know, before, so. What else, you fit me, so what, give me, give me some feedback. On, on my wedge fitting, how he terrible. He fit you into a bowling ball. <laughs> he, right? he fit me into a tennis racket. Yeah, two <laughs> tennis rackets and a bowling ball. But no, from your because you fit the best players in the world, mm -hmm. and you work with everybody and from you. yeah, exactly. You you fit everybody from Justin Thomas to me. So what? But I think there's some value in that in terms of what are things that maybe we did that were common to that entire experience, regardless of how good you are or aren't. And and where do you go, man? You, these are the huge differences that you see when you work with players from, you know, a variety of ability levels. Yeah, I think f for me, I asked a lot of questions. I peppered you with questions because I was trying to identify where are strengths, where are weaknesses, what's your course like, you know, what, what are your fears? And we identified those pretty quickly. We realized the majority of your shots are on the thinner side, which means you're not utilizing the bounce at all. You're not even using it. Correct. So what's the point of having it, right? So that, Correct. so that's part of the, that's part of the process is saying, okay, if this is if this is my player's fear, what do I need to do to get him or her to do what you naturally do in golf, which is thump the turf and allow the wedge, the ball, and the ground to work together, right? right. We increase bounce here and there. We decrease bounce here and there. We offer some variety in your grinds and in your bounces because essentially that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a matrix of wedges that give you the best chance to go out and play really good golf. Good golf comes from confidence. So if I can provide tools for you that make you feel comfortable in what you're doing, then you're going you're gonna to go out and have more fun and shoot better scores ultimately. So for you, we identified that your 50 had too much bounce. We needed to actually clean up your strike. Because at times, <laughs> at, times, at times what you would do is you would make early contact, yep. your ball flight would go up, yep. your spin would reduce, yep. and you'd have inconsistent carry numbers. So we early take some, contact. I like early, that. Early it contact. doesn't sound as bad. So, <laughs> do you have any pills for early contact? <laughs> <laughs> so we changed that, and now we have consistent sub-30 launch, good spin numbers, and consistent carry more importantly, right? right? One of the things we talked about was the importance of swinging 85% speed or less. <laughs> and we learned this through the sand wedge testing, right? We, look, we, we found out that he had a 56 degree, it was 23 yards distance between, difference between the, the gap in the sand, which is too much. As it turned out. 13, 13 <laughs> yards, <laughs> yeah, that's a big gap. You know, there's a lot of guessing going on there. So trying to tighten that up and say, okay, I think we can get closer to your gap, have a nice clean distance number between those two, but then go greenside, and I can prove to you that all the shots that you're concerned about, that's the you can actually do. Yeah, so that was that was a really interesting dynamic where it's like, okay, so we got gap wedge to you know roughly one low 120s, right? It was kind of once we got a consistent number, trajectory, spin, it was carrying in the low 20, you know 120s. So we said, okay, our next club, I, you got to get me to 109, you know 108, 109, whatever. So I'm hitting 56, and it's going 100. I'm like, well. Now we got a problem, there's 22 yards. So it's like, in my head, it's like, okay, can we get to that 109, but am I gonna still be able to hit the shots around the green that I want to mm -hmm. be able to hit? So the way you got me to 109 was really interesting, though, where it was the kind of quintessential less is more. 
you know, because I hit one, I don't know, let's say it went 108 or something like that. You're like, hey, just try to hit this one 105. Just try to take a little bit off 105. What happened? It went further. That's right. And I was like, come on. And so what happened there? And is that typical at all? Because I, that one kind of changed my viewpoint on a lot of this. Yeah, so we learn you were swinging really hard to get this result. And while sometimes you hit those numbers, which is fine, there are often times when you swing that hard where the club catches up, ball flight goes higher than you want it, and now the energy that's supposed to be propelling the ball towards the hole is now shorter because it's just gone in the air for too long. So me telling you to slow down puts you in a better place of connecting with that ball and bringing your launch to where it needs to be, which is in that mid to high 20 range. Um, that allowed you to swing softer. You actually hit your lines better. So there were less, there were less left bias misses, <laughs> right. less right bias misses. You were right on the target line. Um, you still had great spin numbers, but more importantly, you were consistently hitting 108 yards yeah. at the right launch right. without effort. It was pretty simple. In fact, you said, I, I should probably do this with my irons too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't like, there might be something, Crazy. No. might be something, because I, I have been, you know, accused of having a very effortful swing. You know, a lot of people have very effortless power. Sure. I have very effortful power. So it it's really, not even like, that much power. It's not even that much power. Continue, yeah. So I'm working really hard to generate, but I think, I think there's probably a lot of amateur golfers that place more of a priority on that effort part as opposed to efficiency. And that was a huge shift for me, is this idea of going from max effort to maximum efficiency. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with wedge fitting, this stuff, whatever, but that, that's just an interesting dynamic because then, like you said, then the grind, everything can do what it's supposed to do then. Mm -hmm. Like, you're like, oh, okay, well, that's kind of neat. And it shouldn't be that hard. It's 107 yards. I mean, it doesn't right. seem like it's really hard, but when, you, when you're talking about the pressures of hitting at 107 to a tight flag, you have to hit it perfect. You really do. Mm -hmm. If you allow it to come up short, especially where you guys probably play your golf, you know, that's, that's death. Some tall bunkers, some tough grass. You know, so it's important that you can swing a little softer and manage how that Pro V1 or Pro V1X gets into those tight pin locations. Do it with trajectory. Yeah, and like you said, the distance didn't go down. It actually went up a yard or so. So uh, there was zero sacrifice in terms of total distance. In yeah. fact, it was just the same, if not slightly better. And dispersion um, kind of yeah. tightened up. Then we noticed well. we noticed that your sand wedge is not a commonly used club around the greens. Some occasional usage, but not enough to say. Not as common as it should be, maybe. Not as common as it should be, yeah. So, <laughs> on the lobby. I do. I just tee grind, let's go, tee grind. But to be let's fair, go. he hits the tee grind really well. I love the tee grind. But it we, chose me. We learned, <laughs> we learned that there's, it's not used a whole lot, right? Right. And the more important thing about that is that he's not really manipulating the face a whole lot. When I say manipulating, there's not a lot of face opening where we're going to have to be too concerned about the trailing edge. If you were to open up the face a great deal, we'd have to be concerned about what grind we put you into because I wouldn't want you to bottom out early and either catch it thin and have it go hot over the greens or you catch it early. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so because of that, that really opens up this door of, well, we can kind of do whatever we want. We can try all these different grinds. I'm not sure he'd even utilize the back sections of some of these grinds. So we can put as much on as we want and we can make a few other shots way easier long bunker shots, Wait. into grain shots, you know, where, where it's maybe Bermuda grass, if it ever gets softer, uh, square face pitching, anything like that where I can essentially free you up to thump the turf like you should and allow the club and the ball to do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> right. Which that's I, a win. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, at least a little bit of a mentality change there too. And then let's get to the 60s because, again, we both ended up in T grind a little bit, like you said. It's always. been always. No, yeah. it doesn't matter. My fitting is predetermined. No, yeah, but it, it, <laughs> that's right. all the cool kids. Let's start with a T grind and we'll figure the rest yeah. out, right? Make it easy. But like you said, you, even in this matrix for this release, you added the 58. So it can't be just me or Tony or others. Like yeah. for something that, so I guess, who's the best candidate for a T grind? And because of and that. And why is it everyone? And why is it me? <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> but also like, 
what might you suggest in terms of maybe carrying another wedge just in case? Mm -hmm. Even the better players in the world, you're telling me, and, and, and maybe speak to that a little bit of even the best players in the world that have tee grind also have something else because sure. that's not a 100% everyday solution. No. So let me start by saying the tee grind, why, why players love it, it's extremely versatile, meaning all the shots that they value and they need at the highest levels of golf is basically put into that club. It's a low bounce option. It's four degrees. So versatility, when you think about that word, it probably means it's not as forgiving as some of the other options we have. But at the highest levels of golf, even at levels like ours, if your course conditions and your technique fit what that wedge is all about, you're going to love it, which is a big reason why you guys do so well with it. Um, at the tour level, it's all about firm, tight, lightly sanded bunkering. Um, you know, these guys are so good with their hands too. It makes, it's really not that big of a deal for them to have a ton of forgiveness. It's probably a big reason why we don't see a ton of K grinds out there at 14 degrees is these guys are looking for the best ability to get them out of these predicaments around the greens that, that the PJ tour and most, you know, all tours around the world makes so challenging. Um, that's the biggest reason why it's number one for us. But every other grind we make is, is outstanding. So if you're playing in firmer conditions, and this is another reason why the tee's so good, of firm conditions, bunkers with a little bit of sand or very compact bases. If you have a shallow angle of attack, if you are from the inside, great driver of the ball, players tend to love that style of sole because you've taken away a lot of the elements at the bottom that would equal forgiveness but add to the versatility aspect around the green. So if you're from the inside, you just kind of slide through that turf so much faster. Is there a common one for one swap? So if I'm a T grind guy, but yep. the course conditions, maybe we go somewhere that's, that's softer or mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's been raining, wh whatever. Yep. What is there a, a common one for one with a T grind? So I was going to bring that up next. We're, we're seeing more and more these days, players around the world are adding an additional 60 or whatever their highest lofted wedges to their bags for condition changes, right? So if things get a little softer, or let's say we go from an M grind at most of the courses here in the US and we go to St. Andrews and it's baked out and crispy and like this table, the M grind's just not gonna work. It's just not. You know, that's why we, we send out a million of them to our partners in the UK. Um, they're gonna have to make a switch. You just can't make good clean contact. So conditions will dictate some of that. Um, coaching will dictate some of that too. You know, as players are making changes in their golf swings, they might make changes in grinds, but I would say most of the time, if the T grind covers 80% of the venues you play in throughout your calendar year, players love the M grind because it's basically the T grind on steroids. It's just a little bit beefier. Then you take players like Justin Thomas, who carries a K at six degrees and a T grind and bases that on bunkering. So he might get into a bunker and say, there's just too much sand in here, or it feels a little soft, or I'm just uncomfortable. He'll bring out the K for that week and switch him in and out. What, what about the V grind? Where does that come into play? Benny Taylor. You guys know <laughs> Benny Taylor? I don't. Do you know Benny Taylor? Ben, 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 ben Taylor. Taylor. He's a title of staff of ours. Uh, he carries V and T. V covers the majority of his, his events throughout the year, and the T comes out when things firm up, so he's kind of the, the flip-flop of that. Sure. The V grind is an interesting wedge because it's a lot of forward bounce for square face play when things are a little soft. So it's, if you're a little steeper, maybe a little over the top, V is great because it just kind of lets you get in and get out in a hurry but does have the versatility on the trailing edge that you need to get around the greens. You asked me a question and you just mentioned something here. You asked me how I hit driver. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that way. I'm like, yeah, I hit it that way. Um, but I had no idea why you're asking me that question. If I'm like, it's a wedge fitting. Mm -hmm. Why are you asking me how I hit driver? Who cares how I hit driver? You know, so explain, so some of the questions you asked me are for very specific reasons of which I had no idea. And that one was maybe the most oddball seeming one to me, but there's yep. a reason you asked that. Well, I asked that because a lot of times what's going on at the top end of your bag will reflect the bottom end of your bag. So if I have a good understanding of how well you work the top end or how poorly you work the top end, <laughs> <laughs> then that gives me a good understanding of maybe why some of the things are happening down here. Right? So for me as your fitter, I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to get as much information as possible. Typically good drivers of the ball are slightly from the inside. And when they're from the inside, they tend to bottom out early. Or they tend to be shallow. They tend to catch a lot of shots low on the face, you know, around grooves, 
one, two, and three. <laughs> and those are those ones where, where you just, you have to, you know, explain to your, to your, to your fitter or to your player, um, you're not using the bounce at all. And they go, why? I'm like, because, because you're shallow. <laughs> so, so that's part of that, part of that process is you give them a tool like we did with the, with the, the F grind today. We said, right. we have to encourage you to thump the turf more often to actually put the bounce to work. If I give you the right bottom to do that, maybe you'll do it more often and you'll make cleaner contact because of it. So, you know, as I'm learning about your driver game, I'm learning about your, your long irons and how all that stuff transitions into your wedge play. And that's allowing me to choose models right away that I think are more beneficial. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, um, you know, you love this time of year. Contracts come up, you know, <laughs> new guys, and, and for, for average golfers, me and Chris come out here, which unfortunately not everybody has a chance to do, but the wedge fitting process is transformative. Like you see it immediately, mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, like you're seeing immediate changes in your game, more so than I've experienced with any other club. Do you get that at the tour level as well when you have a chance to work with somebody new who hasn't kind of gone through the full Vokey experience? You'd be amazed at how many really great players have not been deeply fit. It's, it's, it's crazy, right? Some of the best players in the world who come out here, I ask them the simple question. I go, okay, here's your wedges. Why do you have those in your bag? You know what they say? That's I don't know. I that's what they gave me, right? That's <laughs> this, what, this is what I've always played. I have no yeah. idea. And you just think to yourself, that's crazy, right? You're in the top 50 in the world, we'll say. We'll just say you're a top 50 player in the world and you're out here working with us. Let me help you deep dive into this and, and get a deeper understanding as to why these work and why these don't. And a lot of times what ends up happening, I'll use JT Poston as a great example of somebody who came out here, doesn't tinker with his equipment, doesn't even think about it. He comes out here and, and, and I asked him that question. And he, he said, I don't know. And yeah. I said, well, guess what? Today we're going to find out why. <laughs> and he left with three different wedges. Well, I was going to say, what was the before and after with that? Because, again, you're taking best players in the world, and you can probably make an argument that, in a way, they're their own worst enemy because they're good enough to figure out how to use that wedge in spite of the fact it's not an ideal fit. And so they've kind of been able to work around that. So what did he come in with, and what did he end up leaving with? So we were, we were testing all the different options. He had a... a 5008, he had a 5608, so an M grind, and a 6008. So just kind of M grinds across the board. Okay. And that's pretty common because I think some players just assume that, oh, I'm a, if I'm a 6008 guy, 5608 is probably a good thing. You know, there's, there's some, Why not? There's some similarities. It'll Why probably not? work out fine. It, as the fitting process goes on, a big part of that is, is, is identifying weakness and selecting wedges that take that weakness to a whole nother level of success and create confidence, right? If I give you the same grinds and bounces across the board, you're limited to these shots. And you look at the best players in the world and how they build their bags, they're trying to build versatility, not just in their grinds, but in their bounces, right? So if you're in soft conditions and you have low bounce everything, you're kind of in trouble, unless you're really good at delivering a wedge. So for JT, he was in a 6008, we realized it's too much bounce for you. Because the one thing he said was, I have a hard time sometimes around the greens just not feeling like I can get under the ball. So what do you do when you try and do that? I open up the face. What happens? Now yeah. the leading edge rises. Yeah. And now I'm uncomfortable. And now I change my technique. And I'm just kind of lost. OK, well, let's try this. Just shot after shot was easy. He's like, wow, this is really cool. OK, now let's validate it and take it in the bunker. This is easier in the bunker, too. So now it's like they're just winning everywhere. So then that wedge then takes you into the sand wedge and begin to realize you don't have enough bounce here. What am I supposed to do with this wedge? Well, it has more value than just a fairway wedge. Well, I hit it pretty good from the fairway. OK, let's see what it does on long bunker shots. Let's see what it does into the grain. Chunk, chunk, chunk. So you expose them to a little bit more bounce, and you explain the benefits and say, you don't have to just hit this from the fairway. You can hit this anywhere you want. With the way your game is put together and how you use a wedge, these are all benefits. I'm not taking anything away from you. I mean, it was just kind of a no-brainer there, too. So now you have one low bounce and one high bounce short game tool. Everything in the middle you can do now. And then you get into the gap wedge, and you begin to realize, OK, we've got a good distance wedge here. The math makes sense. Everything's working out nicely. Do we have a bottom, though, that encourages you to take a divot or to at least make contact with the turf? because there were often times where he would come up shallow and he'd catch it a little thin. 
and his ball would go low right or low yeah to the low to the right yeah. so we tested him in 50 12 and we said what do you think of this i feel like i can just hit and that was really the defining moment like this is why you come and you get fit is you need to understand why these things work and now when he goes greenside he can hit the sand wedge he can hit the lob wedge everything feels really comfortable for him so that's why you know it's important to understand these cool. So he went three for three in terms of swapping stuff out. Yeah. So, I mean, that's great for, for guys like you and me who are fortunate enough to be able to come here and obviously tour guys mm -hmm. that you work with. But what about average golfers who don't have access to this type of situation or, or maybe even very limited about as far as what wedge fitting tools are available to them? Mm -hmm. how, how can just a regular guy go into something like a Dick's or a PGA Superstore or even a local pro shop where you know, maybe, maybe they don't have expert wedge fitters. Mm -hmm. How can they go into a typical retail environment and come out with a wedge or two or three wedges that are gonna work for their game? Mm -hmm. Well, we have our app. Yeah. So, hey, yo. <coughs> hey, yo. Oh, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> Welcome back. Great job. Uh, <clears throat> no, I mean, like you said, you, you can get fit by Aaron all the way down to you can go fit yourself. Um, don't recommend yourself. that. I don't, don't recommend fit that. yourself. But there are options for that. That's a t-shirt. Yeah. That's a t-shirt right there. There are options. Uh, we have an online wedge selector tool. You can go on there, answer questions, same questions he asked, maybe not to get into the driver, but types of shots you hit, where you're most comfortable, what's, the, what's your current iron setup to get you the proper gapping. That's number one. Number two um, is going to your local pro or one of those stores and getting fit. There's an app that you hit a few shots on TrackMan or Foresight, and it will track your descending angle and uh, shaft lean, and it'll help you determine, uh, again, it's asking you questions, where do you use this? Um, also, just going in and just trying them. Um, if you grab all five 60s and next to them, even on a mat, you will know right away which ones do and don't work. Hit different types of shots. Um, there are some that you, you're going to hit one of them the most consistent. And now that we have those radar devices, you can look at launch angle and spin. You can see which one's spinning the most, which one's spinning the least. That's probably not the one you're going to want. Um, there are ways to do it, but obviously outside on grass is the best. Sure. Um, but the, again, starting with the on, online selector tool, it'll, it'll get you a start on where, which one is maybe the best for me. But again, going and trying them, um, not just going in and saying, ah, this, oh, this is the one in the middle, I'll do that one because I'm not too high or too low. Right. You might be, but trying them against each other is, is your best bet. What, do you, what should a golfer look for in terms of, and Aaron mentioned it earlier, but what, what's the right launch angle for a wedge? Because I think a lot of people maybe think they need to hit these high towering wedge shots and you guys are saying, no, you want it low and spinny. So what, what's, what's that launch angle I should be looking for on a launch monitor? I'm gonna add to that too. What are the top three, five things? Like, so if I'm doing that, right? So I'm gonna go in and try these couple things out or whatever. A lot of times golfers are their own worst enemies because they don't know what good is. You know, they might be able to say, hey, this one feels better. Um, but if there were, you know, three, four, five things that they should look and say, okay, you know, launching, angle spin, whatever the case is, and they're going to do that for themselves. What are those things? Well, I would say number one is start with gapping. Make sure your math makes sense. So work off your pitching wedge. Hit that first. 13 yards-ish in between each wedge I think is a nice gap. Once you get into the 60 or 58, that's less about distance. It's really more about how it performs around the green. So I'd put more emphasis on whether or not it's hitting the shots that, you know, that you want to that you wanna hit. Um, Work on that launch angle, sub 30 launch numbers. Um, simple, simple math, take the loft that's on the bottom, cut it in half and subtract two. I think that's a good general area you want to- Ready? Can you, you wanna, do that, Tony? This is a 54. What should my launch angle be? We'll go 25, how's that? That's close enough, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so again, but you know, you're seeing sub 30, just as a general rule, to get it under 30. Shoot for sub 30 numbers. Um, the great thing about sub 30 numbers is it takes a little bit of the pressure of spin away because the lower you launch it, the better your spin numbers will be. So when you look at TrackMan data, you look at any, any launch monitor data, if you're higher than 30, you will see a diminishing return on spin and carry. It's gonna shrink. Um, that's because that ball is, is not working efficiently with the face. It's a very oblique strike. 
Um, so you want to get those numbers sub 30 and you're going to see good results from that. So focus on that, the launch, that'll give you the spin. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing shaft testing, find a shaft that feels good, has some weight to it. I think that's an extremely important thing too. And lie angle. I'll add one, I'll add one more. I, you said, well, regardless how, I think feel is very important. If it feels good, it probably is good. Yeah. Means if I hit 10 shots with each and nine of them feel good, you've probably hit nine really good shots with that club. Right. So um, we say if it feels good, it usually is good. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because a thin shot doesn't feel great. Right. A big chunk doesn't feel great. So if you're making clean contact and you're getting those numbers and it feels good, you should probably, yeah, probably listen to that. Feel tends to be one of those things that also helps guide you into the right grinds. You know, if you're not, a, if you're not an expert in grinds, if it feels good, like Kevin says, it typically means you're in something that makes sense for you. You know, so sort of trust what those feels are giving you. Along, along the feel lines, there, again, a, a perception, I think, that, that continues to exist that forged clubs inherently feel better than cast clubs. You guys cast your wedges. How do you six twenty, right? Yeah. How do you how do you build feel into a cast club and really how how important is forge versus cast in, in that in the feel conversation? Yeah, so I think um, all that kind of came out decades ago, right? Forged clubs, what were they? They were blades, mm -hmm. right? And you hit them solid, they felt solid. Well, as investment casting came in, we were trying to make cavity back clubs you know, move the weighting out to the sides and make sure you have these huge sweet spots, things like that. Cast thin faces, ball speed, things like that. Well, I have a blade and I have a cast perimeter weighted club. Right. Two different clubs, they're gonna feel different. Uh, even today's world where we do make forged cavity back clubs and a forged blade, they feel different. No one's really making the exact same club, forged and cast. We've done those tests. We've made the exact same clubs, given them to pros. We can't feel the difference. The thing with casting, it allows you to do more, we'll say it gives you a bigger design freedom to add characteristics to the, especially inside of metal woods, like rails and ribs and things to help sound and things like that. Um, we use it a little bit in wedges to help those things. It's easier to work with. Um, and we're able to get near identical in a slightly different shape in a cast club versus a forged club. So this, it's more based on shape than it is around material. Steel, uh, 8620 carbon steel versus a 1020 forged carbon steel. They're both carbon steels just manufactured differently and it's the shape of it that really produces that sound or feel. So when you have the exact same club, they're gonna feel the same. But the fact that nobody's really testing the one blade versus another blade is not the same. It's, we're, we're testing different shapes along with different forged or cast. So that's where really the difference is, is more in the shape, not necessarily how it's made. The last thing I wanted to ask about, and this one. You your know, last question, this is your last yeah, question, you Tony. You can have one more if you want it. Nope, but, this is your last one. Um, we, we see a lot, <laughs> you guys recommend, I think the number you give replace your wedges every 75 rounds. And, and a lot of the feedback we get is, well, of course, that's what Voki says. They want you to buy new wedges. So kind of what's your perspective <laughs> on that? Like, how often is, is 75 the number? You know, or is it, you know, 75 for a sand wedge? And maybe can I get away with a gap wedge a little longer? And so talk about maybe, Aaron, how, how frequently you replace wedges on tour and then, <laughs> well. and then what what maybe the, the consumer the who, are, yeah. who 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 probably has to pay a bit more than the average tour guy yeah. realistically how often should the average guy be replacing wedges and yeah if it's they're a, copper it's a, a great question uh for for, for <laughs> from from the tour's perspective we replace wedges all the time now these are professional golfers they hit balls all day they practice in the bunker all day they play tons of rounds of golf so they're going to see spin decay a lot faster than we will, right? You take a, you know, Kevin's had a great analogy for a long time about a, a, a pencil and how you sharpen a pencil that you get that razor sharp point. As soon as you start using it, that tip breaks off and breaks off. And before you know it, it's, it's, it's dull, right? So these guys will see that a lot faster. Now, where they see it the fastest is in the highest lofts. So when we focus our attention on making fresh wedges and fresh grooves, 
we're really more focused on the wedges around the greens that are doing the majority of the work. So a guy like Justin Thomas, for example, we will give him a set of wedges at the beginning of the year. It'll be 46, 52, 56, 60. He might try and play that 46 and 52 for almost two years, unless I come to him and say, hey, we're starting to see some funny things with your, with your stats. Have you noticed anything with trajectory? You know, so he's not going to change those out as much because that lack of loft is not changing the performance of the ball as much as a 56 and 60, which again is very oblique in how that ball and that face work together. So we're going to replace that 56 maybe four to six times a year. And that lob wedge, we might replace it eight to 10 times a year times two because he has two different right. 60s. Uh, and then we might venture down a unique path of St. Andrew's grinds or something, you know, y there's all kinds of different at things. So at least 20 times a year, <laughs> roughly. But I would say, but I would say, if we're talking from a consumer standpoint, it's the highest lofted wedges that you're gonna see this lack of spin or loss of spin with. So if you're a 52, 56, 60 player and you hit 60 all the time, you're gonna see that ball start to go like this over time. And you may not even think about it. You might just hit it and just accept it and it's just what it is and I'm grateful to be out playing golf. As it's going up, you are losing control of that ball. That ball is going higher, it's carrying shorter and it's spinning less. So when we talk about getting fresh grooves in your bag, I think that's the important thing to remember is that, does it have to be all of them? No, it needs to be the ones that make the biggest difference and produce the greatest loss in, uh, in spin. Okay. So just for argument's sake, let's say, so in my set, I got 50, 54, 60. Let's just take that 54. We have ideal numbers on it. So we. 59.7. Oh, we're getting to that. Yeah, 50, 54, 59 and three quarters. But let's say I am kind of a track man geek. I am that consumer that hits balls in the winter and sees it. So, okay, I'm dialed in. Here's my launch. Here's my spin. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm going to look at those numbers. Is there a time if it's like, hey, if this varies by more than 10% or something where you're going to say, this is definitely where you need to start thinking about you're losing performance right not just oh we're bokeh we'd like you to buy a new wedge of course it makes sense but you are definitively losing performance as soon as what happens so your launch is going to go up that's the first sign uh, if you put on a loft and line machine and the numbers are perfect your launch is going to go up you're going to see a reduction in your spin numbers and your carry is going to shrink which means you're going to swing harder and then when you start swinging harder we know it it's happens. not going higher and carrying <laughs> yeah. even shorter so so usually those are the, the telling signs that it's time to start thinking about it. Uh, again, you're gonna see it the most in the 58, 60, 62s. Those are gonna give you, again, more of that slip and slide effect that that ball and that face are, are gonna, are gonna, they're gonna do. So pay attention to those numbers. Um, you're gonna see it in the face. Wear and tear on the face is also a sign. You're gonna see deformation of the face. You're gonna see changes in the finish. So if you're a chrome player, you're gonna see that wearing down into a darker, browner, crustier color. Um, if you have the darker finishes, you're gonna see that as well. Um, there are always visual signs in spin decay. Now, you're gonna see them again in the higher lofts way more than you will the sand wedge, but you're gonna see it on that as well over time. Yeah. If you're looking at pure numbers, you're probably looking say three to five degrees and f over 1500 rpms of spin if you see 2000 to 3000 rpms from where you started awesome. it's gone because we're talking you're going from 10,000 to 7,000 correct or that's, so much. That's, that's now 18 to 24 feet of rollout versus five to ten when you started right. i mean now you're having to play for that which you probably didn't even realize you were doing right. Well, because it happens so incremental. I think does. that's part of the thing. It's like, it's like one foot at a time, right? Yeah, well, like, well, we were joking. Like, it'd be, it'd be great if, like, the, the wedge face just exploded. You know, at a certain point, it's like, oh, self now I have to replace it. Just self-destruct. It just, you know. Some kind of penny Spontaneous test, right? combustion talking, or yeah. something where it just explodes. And it's like, oh, got to replace it. But it doesn't, right? It's just a little bit over, over time. And by the time, I mean, like, so many other things, right? By the time it's, you've lost performance you rightfully probably aren't aware of it. No, and, and that's the frustrating thing is that if you're, let's say you're at 100 yards and you're hitting your 60 degree and it's not spinning very much, it's going straight up in the air, if there's no obstacle for it to stop on, it's just going to hit and release. So now you're thinking when you get to that ball and you're like, I'm 12 yards behind this flag, 
do I hit this thing 112 yards? Right. Now your brain's thinking it goes 112 yards. Right. Now what happens if you hit that same shot, but there's a pond or a bunker where that ball first touched down? Right. You really only hit it 90 yards. Right. Right. But you didn't know. Right. Right. So it's important that you have fresh grooves. You should have fresh grooves all the time. But if you had to make a decision to, <laughs> yeah. if, if you had to 20 make times a, a year. 20 times a year, you 20 times a year, just stop by the van. Every, <laughs> knock on the door. <laughs> uh, AD, AD told me to swing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Bring your wallet. Your name's not on the list, sir. <laughs> no, but, uh, but, it's, but it, is, it is extremely important. If you want to control your golf ball, you have to have spin. Yeah. There you have it. I think that's a lot of information. That's a phenomenal amount of information. Hopefully you could all pay attention. Uh, if not, there's going to be a quiz at the end. We'll hand out prizes. Um, no, but we do have a challenge for you. And here's the challenge is we were talking about this earlier. We want to associate a type of food with every grind in the Vokey lineup. Oh boy. And you're going to lead us off because you have a great one. Then I have another one to offer. And then we're just going to offer it up to people, though maybe a Japanese head cover or two coming people's way, but start us off. I'm going with cookies. Cookies, cookies. okay. So M grind, chocolate chip cookie. M grind is a chocolate chip cookie, why? Yeah. Because I think it's, it's the original, Bob's favorite, everybody loves it. It's a great opener cookie. Okay. Nothing objectionable about a chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. It's classic, it's quintessential. Yeah very versatile. Yeah. You can heat it up. You can have them cold. They can be chips ahoy. They can be... You can eat it raw, home, You can eat it raw. Yeah. They can be home-baked. You could risk getting sick. Yep. It's all those couple, Okay. I <laughs> like fine. it. It's no I big like deal. It. Tony, do you have one? I, the tea grind, for me, it's the sugar cookie. Like, it's the... The tea grind. It's the say, one that, the tea that grind got is overlooked the, for too long. Not everybody understands just how good and pure it is. Hmm. So, yeah, that, that's mine. If we got to yeah. play the cookie game. Got to play the cookie game. I like it. Do you have one you'd like to... Like uh, He's like, how did no, I get involved in this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the white macadamia nut, white chocolate came up or something like that. I, that was a good one. I, I'm an oatmeal raisin guy. Not many people like it, and I, I think that is probably maybe like the F grind. Not many people like it, but if you did try it, I think you'd like it. Yeah, it's sneaky good. Sneaky good. It's See? sneaky good. I. That is kind of ooh. the one I don't want to eat, but it does... Yeah. But it's very satisfying. It's satisfying and gets you the result you want. Yeah. And that's what the F grind does. See, that's what I'm telling you, people. There are options out there. We still got, we got K grind to go. We got L grinds. We, like I said, we got, we got low bounce K. We got high bounce K. We got all sorts of options. A's and V's. And A's and V's. And let us know what you the think. W grind. Don't forget the W. There's Don't forget the W grind. <laughs> wow, are there a lot of grinds out there. Anyway, thank you. Until next time, thank you. For being here thanks for all your knowledge appreciate it if you have questions again find us on the interwebs we're around we'll help answer some of those things we out <laughs>